So, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us to this presentation organized in the context of the Quantum Technology Initiative project, as you know. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of hosting Matteo Rubiati, who is a doctoral student among us at CERN, associated to the University of Milano. Uh, uh, before uh, giving the word to him uh, in his presentation, just let me remind you that uh, this presentation is being recorded. You, have, you must have noticed that because uh, uh, you have had to uh, accept that the re uh, approving the recording. But uh, this means that if you have colleagues who, who couldn't make it in time or cannot connect today uh, or uh, live, uh, they will have the chance to see this presentation offline in a couple of days. Also, uh, I didn't I didn't check with Matteo, but in case I get a copy of his slides in any form, I will share it yeah. in the so okay, thank you, Matteo. So we will share it in the Indico pointer, the same through which you have learned about this presentation. And uh, ah, yes, uh, uh, about the questions, feel comfortable at expressing them on, on the fly as, as the presentation goes. Matteo can, can take them. What I propose you to do is just to put a note on the chat or maybe raise your hand using the Zoom trick the, to raise the hand. And, and uh, I can interrupt Mateo at a convenient moment is just to take the question. Okay, like this, we don't interrupt him uh, spontaneously. I think this is all I could tell you. Yes, uh, one more thing is any of you is interested, uh, like Mateo is doing today, uh, to showcase your work. Uh, not necessarily a PhD focus. I mean, it could be also research uh, from, um, it's, it's related research, of, of course, associated to quantum technologies, quantum computing, and, and, and any, I mean, related to quantum technologies. Uh, please contact us. The, inform the contact information is on the Indigo page as well. And like this, we can schedule you. So this is, feel welcome. If, if any of you is interested, feel welcome to, to express your interest. With that, I think that uh, I give the word to Matteo. Uh, we will have uh, something like three quarters of an hour, 50 minutes just uh, in discussing. And uh, thank you again for joining us. And this is the word for Matteo now, the floor. Thank you. Let me know if you see my screen. Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, so uh, thank you, Miguel, for your introduction. And let me start with this schema, with this slide, in which basically I want to present a, a bit more about myself and about the work I, I do, and also about the context in which I was introduced, like one year and a half ago, with the beginning of my master thesis. And so this is the quantum computation context, as you well know. And my idea here, is to try to be, I mean, I am at CERN, we are typically working with data. And so what we want to do in this context, typically is to try to use the quantum computers in order to get some sort of advantages in analyzing data or in tackling problems using quantum computers. We can do that by simulating, or we can do that, and I think this is the most important point, by trying to use uh, directly the quantum devices. If we choose this branch, the red one, of course, we can choose between the quantum annealing uh, strategies and the quantum circuits, that's the most used one. And if we deploy circuits, we used to have NISC devices. With this, we mean devices with a low number of qubits and typically uh, with errors. And so we have some problems, like the problem of hardware control and calibration. That's typical hardware, I mean, is needed when we need to use some hardware. And then the errors. The errors then that we try to tackle by applying quantum error correction and quantum error mitigation techniques. So all this context, I think, it's well tackled by, of course, by doing simulations. And on the, on the other side, we strongly need some custom devices that should be used to 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 lose time to try to try to try again for for finding strategies that they are effective to tackle these uh, kind of um, of problems because I think we all we want to use NISC devices um, already today and so in this context Kibo uh, 
arises in the sense that Kibo is a framework. Uh, in principle, Kibo was born for doing something really like Kiskit, Circ, I mean, frameworks that you really know. And it's a framework um, for which I, I work. I mean, I work with the Kibo team and it's it can be very useful to do quantum simulation, quantum control and quantum calibration, as you will see in a few in a few minutes. So in this slide, I'm here. And during the, the presentation, I will talk to you about, about Kibo, underlying some interesting features of Kibo. And basically in my work, uh, by one side, I used to develop Kibo. I'm part of the core developers of Kibo. And so as I give to Kibo, Kibo returns in the sense that I use Kibo to deploy quantum machine learning algorithms in the context of high energy physics here at CERN. So Kibo is a um, framework, a full stack framework, in the sense that it covers all the part of the quantum computation from the simulation to the hardware control and calibration. Basically what you have with Kibo is a language API and high level language, thanks to which you can do quantum circuits computation and quantum annealing computation. I will speak a bit more about quantum annealing with Kibo in a few, in a few time, but what is important to say here is that after you deploy your algorithm with Kibo, with, high in, with the high level, high level language of Kibo, you can then select a, a backend. A backend is basically the way who, thanks to which we practically deploy the, the theoretical algorithms you, you write down. And so under the simulation point of view, we have some backends like the NumPy backends, the Kibo Jeep backends, about which I will speak in the next slide, and the TensorFlow backend, if you want to use the TensorFlow objects for doing quantum machine learning, for example, or for building up hybrid models. And under the real quantum uh, execution, we have Kibolab. That's a package that's used to do quantum control of the quantum hardware, of course. So yes, this is a general uh, picture of Kibo. And now I don't want to go inside the details of uh, a simulation framework because I, I know you probably well know what Qiskit, Circ and other frameworks do, but I want to underline some features that I think are um, typical of Kibo and that can be useful in the context, in particular in the context of research. That's the one I leave every day. So the first point is that when we do state vector simulation, so we st basically we simulate the evolution of a quantum state by solving linear algebra equations, we have system problems that typically scales exponentially with the number of qubits. And this is, as you know, a great problem in terms of simulation. For that, we deploy, uh, we implemented a backend, a specific backend that's called Kibojit. What's aim is to try to um, reach a speed up in terms of executions and in particular with, an, with a high number of qubit. With a high number of qubit, I mean over 25. I, I can, we can reach 37 qubit simulation with um, CPUs. So basically what we can do in this, in this backend, what we did was to write down a strategy of just-in-time compilation in which uh, we perform just-in-time compilation to speed up the compilation of the algorithm. And in the same time, we wrote down custom operators. And with custom operators, I mean that we try to exploit, for example, the sparsity of the matrices in order to reduce the number of operations that we need to do when we perform linear algebra equations and calculations. So just to explain you a bit more the potentiality of Kibojit, I want to show you this plot in which we represent a quantum Fourier transform execution with a growing number of qubits and using Kibojit with a different kind of classical devices. So the warm colors correspond to CPU and the cold colors correspond to GPU or multi-GPU. So what is clear here is that thanks to the Kibojit backend, we are able to simulate until 37 qubits. That's a nice result. And another important result is that after 25 qubits, so if we deal with 
more than 25 qubits problems, it's suggested with Kibo G to use um, graphic process units or uh, multi GPUs. Right. So we have a speed up in terms of time, as you can see from the y, y axis. So this is the first feature I wanted to, to show you. The second one I think is very interesting is the possibility with Kibo to implement a sort of adiabatic evolution. I mean, a sort of Sim, um, quantum annealing execution uh, directly on a quantum hardware. The, the tricky point is here is that we have an object that's an adiabatic evolution object. I will explain it now. But the point is that we use, um, we simulate basically the adiabatic evolution by deploying the evolution on a quantum, a quantum hardware in the form of a gate, of, the, of a gate computation. So what does I mean that basically what we want to do is to perform an adiabatic evolution. So we start from an initial Hamiltonian H0 and we want to reach a final Hamiltonian H1. The evolution should be adiabatic and it's governed by this scheduling function S that's in principle a function of the time, the evolution time tau, and it can be also um, function of some parameters theta in this case. You have with Kibo, you have these adiabatic evolution objects, uh, thanks to, to which you can set up the Hamiltonians in a sim symbolical uh, form. And this is, I think, one of the most important things here, in the sense that since we use a symbolical representation of the linear algebra objects, you in principle can deploy any kind of Hamiltonian. So you are not restri restricted to use uh, Ising. Hamiltonians, because of course you are only doing a linear algebra in the end. Then what you do is to define a scheduling function that in principle, as I said, can be parametric, a time step. You, you select a solver, thanks to which we are going to, so, to solve the Schrodinger equations um, locally in time. And then you call this adiabatic evolution, evolution object at some final time t, and you get the final state, the evolved state. This is deployed on the hardware by basically by taking this operation, that's a sequence of unitary um, evolu evolutionary operator applied to the state. Then we trotterize them with the trotter decomposition, and then we translate them into circuits. So as I said, this kind of strategy is a sort of quantum simulation of the quantum uh, annealing procedure. And here are some examples of um, some different solvers we use in, uh, in Kibo for, uh, for solving the Schrodinger equation. And as you can see, also in this case, the usage of the GPUs is very, can be very interesting with the growing number of qubits. Uh, this air case, for example, the Runge Kutta solver and so on. So what I want to do now is to, okay, I introduce you Kibo with some specific features. And now I want to show you how can be, uh, I mean, how it works when we try to uh, introduce and to um, develop a full stack quantum machine learning algorithm um, in time. So the point is, at first, of course, the idea. I, I will do this by explaining, I, by showing you my last, uh, my last work I did together with Stefano Carrazza and Juan Cruz Martinez here with the QTI in order to show you, to introduce you other points, uh, other aspects of Kibo uh, by following the quantum machine learning algorithm. So here the idea, and in this case, the idea is to get a sample of data and to do density estimation. So yes, the first step, will be to take the sample and to plot the cumulative density function of the sample. Then we want to use an adiabatic evolution to encode the cumulative density function. So we use a, an adiabatic evolution for doing quantum machine learning fitting. Sorry. The following step will be to translate the adiabatic evolution, so the Hamiltonians, the adiabatic evolution, into a circuit and decompose it into rotations. And we do this because then thanks to parameter shift rules, so yes, derivation rules, we are able to take this circuit that now is fitting the cumulative density function and derivate it for 
calculating the probability density function. And so in the end, we have the density estimation strategy. So this idea in a more concrete uh, point of view is implemented by taking a sample x of x variable x and calculating its cumulative density function values that let me call them f of x. Then since I spoke about adiabatic evolution, uh, we select two Hamiltonians, H0 and H1. And in this case, we select these Hamiltonians such that the energies of these Hamiltonians, I mean, the energy of a, a target observable in principle on the ground state of these Hamiltonians satisfy some specific boundaries that in this case are to, uh, to be zero in zero and to be one in one, because we want to take all a cumulative density function problem. So it's super useful to have two Hamiltonians that provide us with such energies. The second step is then to map the couple of data, variable X and cumulative density function F into the couple of evolutionary time tau and energy E. Okay, so what we do now is, okay, we have this mapping from a sample and the cumulative density function and the adiabatic evolution. And the idea is to train the adiabatic evolution to follow the cumulative density function. So what we do is to run the evolution with a random initial theta vector of parameters into the scheduling function. Then we track the energy of an, of an observable during the evolution. That's the same observable that, that starts to have energy zero when time is zero and one uh, when time is one. Then we calculate some loss function. That's in this case, that's function of the residuals between the energy of a evolutionary time tau k and uh, the value of the cumulative density function for xk corresponding to tau k. And then according to some chosen optimizer, we perform some optimization strategy. And in the end, we obtain the theta best vector of parameters that minimize the loss function. If you want to, to know some, some, some more about this, this strategy, I link here the, the reference. So as I said, the first step when we perform a full stack quantum machine learning algorithm is to simulate, it's, it's natural. And so we use Kibo to simulate this kind of strategy. And I show you how, how, can, uh, how can it work on Kibo. So here you have a plot in which you see in black, the empirical cumulative density function of the sample. And in blue, the training points. What you see in red is the sequence of energies of a Pauli Z observable on the ground state of the, of the adiabatic Hamiltonian that's uh, step by step reaching the H1 condition to the H0 from the H0 condition. So this is the initial configuration of the problem. And by reaching better and better values of the loss function, we show that in the end, the adiabatic evolution is able to encode the cumulative density function into the energy of this observable. Okay, so next step is to reach the probability density function. And we are talking um, still about simulation. So thanks to the adiabatic evolution process, we have a, a, fami um, a family of Hamiltonian that corresponds to the adiabatic Hamiltonian at, at each time during the adiabatic evolution. And what we want to do now is to do some calculations and approximations. I don't want to, be, to go deep into the details of these calculations, but the point is that at first we took such an object that basically is a, a sequential application of uh, sequential, yes, we apply sequentially the um, evolutionary operators to the to the initial state. Okay, if you want to reach some state at time t, you need to apply n time the evolutionary operator. And we want to translate it into a single unitary because it's very easier to be derivated in terms of calculation. That's depending on the time because the Hamiltonian is depending on the time through the scheduling function. And the second step will be to take this unitary and translate it into a form that we can derivate with some particular rules, like the parameter shift rule that um, fits very well with rotations. And so what we, we did is to obtain this form of the unitary operators 
And what happened during the simulation after all these kind of calculations is that after derivating the, the system with the parameter shift rule, we got um, this kind of results. So in the end, we were able with, um, I mean, implementing in Kibo the simulation part to obtain these results. So this is the prediction of the quantum adiabatic machine learning model after the derivation. So you have in gray the data, the histogram of the data. You have in black the empiric, the numerical derivative of the empirical cumulative density function, so the target. And what you see in red and in blue are the simulations done uh, exactly in red and with short noise in blue. The confidence belt is calculated uh, on the short noise. What you see in the lower part of the plot is the same simulation, but normalized with respect to the true, true, true value. With the true value, I mean the black one, so the empirical one. And the yellow plot is uh, quite similar to the blue one, but we only used a fewer number of shots. So the next step is to do, go through the hardware deployment. Because as I said, I think is um, too much important to uh, take under consideration what we can already now do with the hardware. Um, if not, we are not going to do re real quantum computation. I mean, so how to do that with Kibo? Basically, the point here is that until now, Kibo is hardware agnostic. It's a high level language that you can use to deploy your algorithms as you, as you already know by other frameworks. And with Kibo, then you can activate the Kibo app backend. That's ba basically the, the backend that was role is, is that to, um, to do this kind of operation. So to translate, for example, gates into pulses, if we are using superconducting qubits and so on. So what you need to do here is that let's suppose you have your own quantum device or you have your lab, you have access to a laboratory. Then you, you only need to write down a platform object. And in Kibo, basically we wrote down a general platform object, an abstract platform object that can be um, concretized then according to the specific hardware you are working on. So once you have wrote down all the operations in the platform that correspond to, to this kind of operations, so the gates to pulses conversion and so on, you are able to call to, to run the Kibo code directly on the hardware by setting Kibo Lab backend and selecting your platform. For example, right now we are using uh, Kibo for controlling hardware already in four uh, labs in, in all over the world, like in uh, the INFN laboratory in Frascati that's growing, the TII lab in Abu Dhabi, here in Singapore, the Center of Quantum Technology, and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So, yes. And here are some reference about uh, the modularity of Kibo and a way to control quantum hardware. So we spoke about quantum simulation and quantum control. Uh, the next step is to, to say and to understand that Kibo Lab is not enough in the sense that, um, as I wrote here, each quantum control routine is useless if the sequence of pulses are not well calibrated with the single qubit. With this, I mean that we need something more that in Kibo, in the Kibo environment is Kibocal. Kibocal is another package that's, uh, that was born in this, the last summer in uh, 2022, in, yes, in the summer of 2022. And the idea of Kibocal is to perform a series of calibration routines and characterization, single qubit characterization routines, thanks to which basically ha happens the follow. So you have an algorithm and you want to run it with Kibo. Then you want to go to run the same algorithm on the hardware. But for doing that, you need to provide the quantum process unit with some, for example, sequence of pulses. Kibocal is useful because you fine tune the right parameters to be provided to Kibolab in order to run in the better, in the best way, the, the code on the quantum process unit, qubit per qubit. And Kibocal basically is composed of a series of calibration and characterization routines that involves circuit characterization, like, like randomized benchmarking routines. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of routines that can be used for that, but 
basically the idea of kibokalistic form is what I said. And here are some more reference about kibokal. So what happened if we want to deploy the quantum machine learning algorithm I showed you before on the hardware? The point is that, of course, uh, we have some result, uh, but we see that, I mean, right now we have hardware that, that you already know are NISC. So we have um, errors in what we do. And moreover, I want to underline here with this slide that uh, if you consider one, one device, in this case, I consider it one five qubit device, and in particular, two, two qubits of the five qubit device, the purple and the red results are associated to the qubit zero and one of the device. We see that after the calibration and characterization, each qubit reacts in a different way on the same problem. And in blue, you see uh, another qubit of the device that had, of course, some problem of calibration in this case that then we, we fixed. So after this, I want to open some questions and maybe a discussion with you later about this. The first question is, um, okay, in this case, we took parameters that were obtained by optimizing a procedure classically. So this plot is done by optimizing the adiabatic evolution classically, taking the best parameters and then using them to execute the circuits. So we filled the circuits with the parameters and we performed the predictions. So the question is, what if the entire training is performed on the device? So if maybe the errors are reabsorbed into the results and we can obtain a better estimations, better estimations. And the other question is what we need more for improving results on the hardware and how, how can we work using a software or a framework, framework like Kibo that's at 360 degrees on the quantum um, computation uh, scenario. Um, okay, so to answering for to answer to the first question, I want to cite, I want to show you another work I did uh, in the last year that corresponds to my master thesis uh, work in which we decided to try to train an entire quantum machine learning algorithm on the hardware. So basically what we did is to follow the procedure presented by Adrian Perez Salinas and colleagues uh, in the paper data re-uploading for a universal quantum classifier in order to try to understand if we could build a universal quantum regressor. So nothing new basically, but the point here is that we want to deploy the entire training on the hardware. So we decided to use such a model with a re-uploading strategy in which we took the target X data and we uploaded the data into a sequentially, I mean, into a sequence of gates. And then we used a, an expected value like a predictor uh, for the Y uh, variable. And we decided to build up an ADAM optim optimization, so a gradient descent optimization, calculating the gradients uh, with the parameter shift rule in order to be able to perform them directly on the hardware, as you know. So an analytical gradient descent. The first step, as I said, is the simulation. So we simulated some results. Here we have uh, the proof that, of course, as we expected, the, the quantum machine learning algorithm could, could work. And in the end, we try to, okay, here, of course, you are seeing the initial predictions uh, of, the, of the model in yellow, the target in uh, red, and the blue dotted line is the final prediction of the model. And then, as I said, we try to go uh, to run the gradient descent on the hardware. These are the results. The green one, you see in black the true low. The continuous green line is the um, final result we got. And then there is the confidence belt. These final results were obtained by training the regressor, the quantum regressor, directly on the hardware. We did the training points that you can see like scatter uh, dots on the plot in green. And these are prediction, random prediction of the training points that are distributed on the X axis. And then after we got the final best parameters after the gradient descent, we took 100 points on the axis 
And for each of these points, we calculated 100 times the prediction of the model. And then with the means and the standard deviation, we plotted the confidence belt. So this same plot can be seen maybe better here. Uh, that's, I mean, these are the same results, but normalized with respect to the true low, the black one. And you can see here the green results are uh, almost compatible with the, with the true low for a great part of the range uh, of the data. And the results are, com I mean, are comparable with some results we obtained, the red one, with a genetic algorithm. The point is, I think, the interesting point here is that we performed a strategy in which we had errors in each evaluation of the circuit during the performance. And with this, I mean also when we evaluated gradients, each time we wanted to update the parameters during the gradient descent. So I think the amazing point here is that thanks to the full stack framework, so Kibo, Kibolab, and Kibocal, we were able to reach a result like this. And I want to use to exploit this result also for opening uh, again the, um, the question I, I introduced before. So maybe it can be, I don't know, because this, this circuit, of course, was a very short circuit, a few number of gates. So maybe this can be the answer. But maybe also the fact that we train it directly on the hardware could be um, in some way helpful in terms of mitigated the errors in a live training for a real, I mean, for a real quantum execution and not a simulation. And to tackle the second question I did before, so what we can do to get nice resistance on, on the hardware, I want to show you a work in progress that I'm doing together with other guys of the Kibo team, in which basically we wanted to reproduce some fit of high energy physics data. We wanted to, to reproduce fit of uh, the U-quark parton density function that are presented in this uh, interesting paper, determining the proton content with a quantum computer. And so what we want to do here is to try to see if some error mitigation technique during the evolution, I mean, during the training, so real, real time on the hardware can be useful or uh, is not as useful um, as the moment in which we try to perform simply the entire training on the hardware. So I, I'm trying to mixing the two questions right now. So these are some results only under the point of view of the simulation in which you can see the exact simulation result. So here we have a feed basically of the U quark PDF. Then we did the same, but applying a noise model with key that's implemented in Kibo. And as you can see here, the, mo the, um, the noise starts to push the results to be closer to zero as the model used to, used to do. But after uh, applying error mitigation techniques during the execution, so for each circuit evaluation, not circuit evaluation, sorry, for each, for each prediction and for each gradient evaluation, we had this result that we really want to reproduce on the hardware and the, the work is upcoming. I mean, we are going to run on the hardware in the next weeks. And yes, so in principle, I finish in the sense that uh, I want not to go so long on that. And let me finish by 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 sharing you again the point. I mean, how how I think I'm excited to be part of, of the Kibo team. And this because, uh, as I hope was able to show you, Kibo is a perfect environment to try to tackle quantum machine learning problems under all the perspectives we can introduce in the quantum computation context. And I think this second point is uh, even more important for me, is an, an, an environment in which, I mean, it's a sort of research-centered network in which I, I think we can grow up really faster by, I mean, by speaking, by discussions and so on. So I leave you again one, one more time here, the picture I draw. I drew at the beginning of the of the presentation, hoping that now has more more sense. And I also leave you some references here. So if you want to use Kibo or to contribute to Kibo, uh, you are welcome. 
and here you have the link to GitHub, and then I'll also leave you the link to the documentation of Kimo. So yes, thank you very much for your time, and I finish. Excellent, thanks. Many thanks, Mateo. Uh, we had already one question that I didn't want to interrupt you because it was just when you were expressing your conclusions uh, from Bogdan. Okay. So I, I can read it or Bogdan, if you want to interact uh, live with uh, with Mateo. Do you prefer that? No, it's it's okay. So I, well, I was wondering if uh, from Kibo we can easily go to uh, to Quezon or Kazan, how it's written. Yeah, yes. Yes, in the sense that each circuit, uh, I mean, when you define a circuit object, you have a um, function, a module that's two quas, and yes, you get the quasm language. So in principle, of course, you can also have some benchmark with other frameworks. You can, yes, you can Great. generalize your implementation, of course. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So... Who else uh, is uh, we also feel feel free to also to make comments? Eh? You are not obliged to keep stick, stick to questions, <laughs> comments on the research or feedback. Uh, anybody else? Oh yeah, so, uh, Rodrigo. Rodrigo is congratulating you for an awesome presentation, which <laughs> all of us agree. Of course, the pity is that we cannot uh, offer your clapping, the typical clapping of the audience, because we are just on, on our own offices. But consider yourself uh, be clapped at least with the Zoom. Thank Zoom you, <laughs> thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you. All. So um, uh, I see. I see nobody. I mean, feel, feel also free to. I mean, now you can raise your voice. You don't need to uh, stay on the chat. Sorry. Yeah, I please have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. A uh, very nice presentation. So I want to ask. Maybe I missed it. But which quantum hardware you're using? Oh, um, yes, right question. Um, it depends on the laboratory, of course, but I would like to refer to the to the one we, I, I use. That's the TII one. And there we have transmode qubits, so superconducting qubits. And that's the reason for which I speak about pulses. And oh, yes. Okay. okay. So, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, sorry, you mentioned for the BSC, uh, uh, since they now will get the quantum computer, even two in the future, mm -hmm. will, can it be inco incorporated with their quantum computers? Probably yes. I think yes. Yeah. I, I mean, in principle, Kibo, yes. I, I think yes. Okay. Because I yes. collaborate with them, my supervisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tour. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. It's, it's something is going to be, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, Mateo, I, I think I interrupted you in the middle of your phrase, but uh, do you want to see more? No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Uh, the only point is that I know there are contacts between the groups. Uh, I'm not the one who is keeping the contacts, but uh, I think the answer to your question is yes. Mm. Okay, so any other? No, I don't see. No no people rising no quest no more questions on the chat so in that case i think uh, well first of all uh, let me make it like this <laughs> since we cannot offer you anything better uh, but uh, thank you very much mateo for your for your time uh, for having shared i take that also that the people who have been participating if they, if they are willing to contact you they can do it directly because uh, your the info, the, your coordinates are also in the in the slides and on the on indico too yes yes so also if, if yeah they, I mean, ahead, for discussing about the results or, or if you really want to collaborate with us i think it's, I mean, it was the the main the main message i wanted to share with you yeah. So if if any of you is confused about how to contact, please contact uh, us. I mean myself, for instance, and I can transmit. It's no no problem to have this passed on. So with this, uh, we close the session. Uh, we thank you all uh, very much.